Hey there, and welcome to the TonalTrends.com song statistics video blog. Today we're starting a five-part series about songs from the movies, TV shows, and amusement park rides of Disney. So like, check this out. Did you know that the most common tempo used in Disney songs is 106 BPM? You know, it's just like Cruella de Vil and Winnie the Pooh, and it's off to work we go for a spoonful of sugar, etc. What about that the most common modulation is to modulate up a major second? You know, so you're like, under the sea, and then you're like, da, 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 under the sea, you know, and then the, the modulate up, you know, they would probably call it, you know, modulating up a fathom, but anyways. Uh, then there's that one, so you know, like, my soul is spiraling in frozen fractals all around. And one thought crystallizes like an icy blast. I'm never going back, those modulations are in the past. Next, did you know that the least common tessituras or vocal ranges for melodies within a major six to two octave range are the minor seventh, which just sounds like this. Then also the major thirteenth. That's also not a very common tessitura. That's like. And when it comes to verse, chorus, bridge, and all that, Disney songs actually have more instrumental sections than any other, even more than verses. And last for now, okay, so you've heard um, of the three chord song, right? Well, Disney songs use an average of eight and a half different chord triad types each. And that's not even including inversions or voicings or colorings. I mean, it's a lot of chords. Okay, if you think this type of thing is as interesting as I do, I hope you'll stick around for these five videos full of songwriting and music theory tidbits from Disney songs. Okay, and as always, if you'd like to skip the explanation portion and get straight to the data presentation, I'll pull up a little box right here now uh, telling you how many minutes I had to skip to. All right, staying with me for um, some context, let's get further into it. So, why Disney? Well, I chose Disney songs for my next stat study because the songs themselves are so pro. I mean, I love pop music. 80% of what I teach my students is pop music. But for a song to make the cut for a feature film, it's just more likely that the writer's going to have to have a couple more tonal tricks up their sleeves than you know, they'd need for your average pop hit on the radio. For example, songs in the Rolling Stone Greatest Songs of All Time list had an average of like four to five chords each. But remember, Disney songs use an average of eight to nine chords each. I mean, two of the songs in the Toy Story movies, they had 18, 18 chord tri types each. <laughs> I right know. I mean, in like Disney songs modulate to other keys almost 10 times more than songs from the Rolling Stone list. They use multiple section variations and tempo variations and like fairy dust and stuff. I mean, they're just really juicy songs most of the time. And yeah, it's not that more chords or more keys or more variations makes um, a song better. It's just that more chords and keys and more complexity of content. It just makes it all the more fun for a guy like me to dissect and more fun to talk about in a video like this to you. Okay, next I want to talk about the embedded data spreadsheet for this series. I kept the spreadsheets fairly polished this time so that they'd be readable by um, people other than me and so that people could peruse all the data and charts themselves if they want to. Cool, right? So yeah, they're embedded on each video's webpage at tonaltrends.com. So if you're watching on YouTube or somewhere else and you'd like to see the data at your own pace and in your own time, just follow the link down there somewhere um, and you can get your nose down into the nitty gritty details yourself. Also, if you're interested in how I did this or my methodology, like for instance why I sometimes use fixed Roman numeral analysis or functional, like the slashy numerals, um, or why I rounded all BPM tempos to even numbers instead of using all the numbers, um, that sort of thing, uh, you should go back and watch my videos about the Rolling Stone list. Most of your questions I don't answer here will be answered there. If not, just ask me in the comments. All right, what you won't find in those last statistic videos, though, are explanations of some of the new data fields I added to this study. Form sections, stepwise motion of modulations, melodic tessitura, and a general comments field. Um, so yeah, I'll be explaining those things as we get to them. Okay, next, you might be wondering, how did I select the songs in this study? Well, I didn't. Disney's publishers did. I mean, they know better than me what the best Disney songs are anyway. So yeah, commercial. I simply chose all the songs from the new illustrated treasury of Disney songs, sixth edition. This is the songbook that not only has the most songs in it of all the options out there, but it also has the most accurate, least dumbed down arrangements. Um, and it's great, you should get it. Um, and additionally though, uh, just to keep it up to date, I did add a few Disney movie songs that came out after this last edition. 
uh, for a nice round sampling of 70 songs. Okay, one more thing before we get to the main course. The difference between what Disney publishes and what ends up on the silver screen. And again, if you're antsy to get to the data, you can skip ahead. I just, I just got to complain for a bit. Okay, first thing about film versus sheet music is that even though this book was the most accurate and definitive book I could find, there were still quite a few inconsistencies. Like the keys the songs were in, you know, actually only matched the book about 56% of the time. Probably because of the tug of war between singers or like good musicians who don't mind sharps and flats um, and publishers who think that they can sell more books if they don't scare people off with a bunch of hard key signatures. Just one example of this is that uh, the published version of the first song in the book, Minnie's Yoo-Hoo, is written out in the key of F, right? Um, which has just one flat. But in the Disney Classics version you can buy on iTunes, it's an F sharp, a key with six sharps. Um, and in the original cartoon it's completely different too. The songs played in both a flat, you know, Mickey sings it and everybody joins in later, and E flat, and then the sing along is great. Um, but yeah, both of those keys have multiple flats, so, so yeah, there's some ins inconsistencies going on. Okay, next I'd like to whine about how the song forms almost never match the book. Only six of the sheet music arrangements, that's only 9%, had the same song forms as what was going on in the movies or TV shows or amusement park rides. Uh, mainly this was due to the instrumentals, intros, um, or other little sections they felt like they didn't need to publish in the book. Um, or sometimes the songs would just be too long or complicated for the publishers to whittle down for mass consumption. Like the most egregious offender was Part of Your World, where they left out the entire first two sections of music. It's like 40% of the song they left out. Ah. So yeah, because of this infernal snippy snippy in the book, I opted to mostly go with the full movie or TV or ride versions of the songs over their book transcriptions. I say mostly because there were some exceptions where the book had fuller versions, like the end credit versions or the original composer's versions of the song that were more interesting and more fleshed out um, than the in-movie versions, which were sometimes chopped up for timing and to serve the flow of the story. So yeah, this is also a study unintentionally about the different ways a song can be treated when transmogrified from the printed page, to film, to pop radio, and to any other of the diverse forms Disney songs have found themselves in. But yeah, whatever was more interesting or whatever I thought the composers of the songs would have wanted me to include, that's what's in this stat study. Alright, finally, let's hop inside my computer. Okay, speaking of composers, before we get a look at our first graphs, gotta give a shout out to the heavyweights whose names appeared the most in the upper right corners of the sheet music. Okay, coming in at first place by a long shot was composer Alan Menken with 13 songs representing. Next we have Frank Churchill with seven music credits and one lyrics credit to his name. The indispensable songwriting team of the Sherman Brothers had seven songs, and last, two lyricists, Ned Washington and Larry Maury, have their words immortalized in the book six times each. Next, we got our first chart, yearly output of songs. And these are copyrighted by year, so some will be biased on the earlier side of things. Sometimes a film is released a year or so after the song is written. Starting out, we have a couple of songs from the early cartoons. This aforementioned first one here, Minnie's You Who, had lyrics by Walt Disney himself. And it's actually the only song he ever took a writing, a writing credit for. And then it's just boom, Snow White, and boom, Pinocchio, with four songs each. No other movie after this had that many songs included in the book. But yeah, after the successes of these two uh, classics, they made a few more. And then WW2 happened. So uh, Disney switched over to making war movies. Like there's this one where Donald Duck quacks about how awesome it is to pay income taxes for the war effort. There's also one where he throws um, tomatoes at Hitler's face. Uh, there's even a song for it that goes like, When der Fuhrer says, we is the master race. We heil, 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 right in der Fuhrer's face. <laughs> yeah, I kind of kind of bummed that that song didn't make it into the study. More people need to know about Disney's war propaganda. It's awesome. Okay, then after that, there's a pretty solid stream of output and peaks, both post-war and in the early 50s, and another peak in 63 and 64. And then Disney died. So yeah, that was definitely a contributing factor as to why not much is happening in this 18-year portion of the graph. Big time song drought going on. Big time animation, uh, animated feature drought in general. I mean, Disney trivia fans know that during this time the whole animation department was actually moved off of the main lot in favor of live action stuff. 
uh, live action being a somewhat harder medium to insert songs into, I guess. But, I mean, we do have Pete's Dragon here in the middle being like, I'll be your candle on the water. I'll sing songs in the middle of the drought. After Disney's death, there wasn't a lot of songs. Okay, but yeah. Then the famous resurgence, or renaissance, as they call it in the book, which was spearheaded by our first place composer, Alan Menken, and lyricist Howard Ashman, who helped resurrect Disney movie music magic with songs from The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin. After which we have our longest unbroken streak of over a decade of constant annual movies and their songs. And then at the end of this chart, we uh, just have a couple of tunes I added for good measure. Not sure if uh, there are ones that the publishers would have chosen um, or whether they would have included more, but maybe we'll find out when they publish the seventh edition. Anyways, whatever the future holds, there's definitely no hints that we'll be seeing any extended song drought like we had in the 70s and 80s anytime soon. Next, let's look at a chart with data for melodic tessitura. All right, so... Melody is definitely the hardest part of music to try and statisticize or get stats from. And I think that has to do with the same reason why there's not really a good way to teach melody writing. Most people I've heard talk about the subject agree that it's more of a knack people are born with. You either have an ear for it or you don't. So yeah, I mean, we could like take all the melodic intervals in a line and put those on a graph, but I'm guessing we wouldn't find anything more than... Um, the general principle that melodies will probably use smaller intervals more than larger ones and consonant intervals more than dissonant ones and also intervals with more diatonic instances. I don't know, maybe there's something to be found, maybe not. Maybe a good way to teach melody writing can be found. But for now, we'll just get by with data um, we got from our chart for tessitura or range of melody. So yeah, here's the overall finding here. The most popular tessituras are the ones with the most common diatonic instances. And as is natural to the limitations of the human voice, the winners are also mostly to be found in the middle of our chart range. And yeah, real quick, here's what I mean by diatonic instances. So in any diatonic major or minor key, you're going to have some intervals that happen more than others. For instance, the perfect octave or P15 double octave interval happens all seven times you play it starting on any of the seven notes in a diatonic scale. Like let's just take C major here for instance. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we're back at the octave. Those are all perfect intervals. On the short end of the stick, the tritone, or as we see um, for our tessitura study, sharp 11 or flat 12, that only happens one time um, in all the 11th or 12th intervals. Let's do 12th here. So we got right there, perfect 12, perfect 12, perfect 12, perfect 12, perfect 12, da, 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 da. Only one tritone, and back to perfect 12th as the um, series starts again. Back to our chart, our longest four columns here all have at least five, six, or seven instances that they happen naturally in a diatonic scale, with the major ninth and perfect twelfth leading the pack. Coming in after these first four, we have tessituras of a minor tenth and a major tenth in green and yellow. And these bars support our original thesis pretty well, too, in that the green with four diatonic instances slightly outdoes the yellow with three. And again, we can point to the fact that um, they're in the middle of the chart to explain why they are more protruded than other greens and yellows. Next, here's an interesting thing, the tritone. It, uh, it beat out all the purples, or two instant tessitura intervals. Personally, I would have figured that at least this purple guy here, um, especially since he's in between the first and second place guys, would have had at least a somewhat comparable showing, but uh, go figure. All right, let me switch to edit mode so I can show you something you may or may not have noticed by now. So yeah, do you see how it kind of rainbows out in opposite directions from the tritone? Pretty cool, huh? Math, man. Patterns found in nature. Pretty neat. Or it might be like a government conspiracy, like the Rosicrucians or something. I don't know. But, okay, let's close out this video by mentioning just a couple of my favorite melodies and why I like them. So yeah, let's go back to our theory that most melodies like to move by smaller steps using scalar motifs or stepwise motion, saving their leaps for effect. Just like they're doing like Mary Had a Little Lamb, you know? Well, the chorus from Pinocchio's I've Got No Strings bucks this trend with a very uppy downy ping pong, you know? It's like, ha, 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 
huh? It's the opposite of Mary, since it's mostly all chordal, saving just a few scalar notes for the very end. It's delightfully clunky and clumsy and very appropriate for a puppet tripping down stairs during his first day of life, let alone his first day in the show business. Another one I like for how it matches up and serves its subject matter is the You Can Fly melody from Peter Pan. There's uppy downy stuff here too, but it's not clunky or clumsy at all. In it, the speeding and slowing and swooping of the flying children is mimicked by the melodies crescendo, decrescendo, accelerando, retardando, and glissando. You know, it's like do 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 da do 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 da do 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 I mean, it's just super fun to have an excuse to use this much expression in a melody. All right, next, let me show you this page right here from The Lion King's Can You Feel the Love Tonight? There it is. Anytime you see this many intermittent 16th notes um, and lots of ties tying them together, you know you're going to have something else that ain't your method book, Mary. And what I like about a messier look and, you know, melodic line like this that requires so much extra ink is that since we don't normally speak in common time signatures, um, it's more likely going to express how words are spoken naturally. Either that or the funky looking ink is just going to give us some pretty funkin' sounding melodies in general. And to best demonstrate why I like that, let me sing it without the 16th notes and ties. Like, what if it was all changed to accommodate just a quarter and eighth note grid, you know? Na 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 Oh no, that's, okay, it's like Na 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 you feel the beat Which I'm so I'm kind of starting to like that. But anyways, next one's an instrumental melody I really like, um, from the bridge to Let It Go from Frozen. It's got these schizophrenic thirds that can't really decide if they're major or minor. It also has got both major and minor seven scale degrees, further smudging the colors. You know, that's the part that's like... Do, 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 minor than major than minor major do, 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 minor than major than minor major and then like after it's played once it's played again twice as fast you're like do little 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 I mean it's all flourishy and it's like you're in a blizzard or something I just love it uh, last favorite for its sheer gargantuan gratuitousness bombastic Ah, is the last melody treatment in the end credits version of Go the Distance from Hercules. This is Michael Bolton at his most Boltony Boltonness. It's like for most of the whole song, he only ever goes as high as an A, you know? Na 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 na. That's pretty high anyway. But then at the very end, he tweaks the line so he can sing up to a B. Yeah! One step higher. But then right after that, he wasn't done because wham! C sharp. Could go the distance. And then over the next few measures, he falls all the way back down, a whole octave and a fifth. And then he climbs an arpeggio all the way back up. And then he just socks you again with those two high flyers, you know? One more time, it just knocks you right back down. Alan Menken plus Michael Bolton. It's a powerful cocktail. Okay, that's it for this one, but I hope you can stay for the next video, Disney Song Statistics Part 2, Keys and Modulations. And yeah, thanks for watching, and please make sure to click the like on Facebook, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter, join the mailing list, and tell all your friends about the songwriting and music theory videos at tonaltrends.com. Peace, y'all.